Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to uh, day two of, of DBQ prep here, uh, getting, getting you ready for the exam. Um, wanted to, to let you know that uh, Mr. Mitchell is planning on, on doing this video today, um, but, but this morning he uh, woke up and his blood pressure was even higher uh, than it was yesterday. But, uh, you know, thankfully, uh, me and some of his other, you know, family and friends have kind of talked him into going to to the doctor next week, which you will to get that that addressed, and he will be uh, uh, doing better for you. But um, I'm going to go ahead and do today's uh, DBQ prep uh, in an attempt to to keep him as healthy as as we can. Um, today's prep is going to be a little bit different than yesterday. Uh, yesterday, all we did is kind of go over the um, the rubric and and kind of tell you how each point is going to be earned. And um, what we're going to do today, though, is actually look over a DBQ and sort of behind me, I'll move the camera as, as we get into it, but we'll kind of go over here and talk about the ways uh, in which you kind of break down your documents to, uh, to use them in your body paragraphs. And then we'll come up with an outline over here <laughs> at the end. But uh, that's what we're going to be doing today. I need you to open up in Canvas uh, the link to the documents and then scroll down to I think it's page five or six where the DBQ will start and you'll see where it'll start. This is a modified DBQ like we talked about yesterday. So I'm gonna need you to ignore documents three and six, ignore documents three and six. And then we're only gonna work with the remaining five. Um, and I should have renumbered them over there and you'll see what I'm talking about in just a minute. Um, and I might just do it in, in real time as we are uh, looking at it. But to show you what that looks like, I'm going to quickly share my screen and then we will um, look at that from here. But uh, basically, this is a page you're going to be looking at. This is where the DBQ starts. The DBQ we're working with today is from last year's exam administration, and it's about the progressive era. So something relatively recent that you went over, uh, thankfully, in class before schools closed. But we're going to be using documents one, so this one here. Uh, we're going to be using two. We're not going to use three. We're going to use four, five, not six, and seven, which is about prohibition. So uh, before I start kind of breaking down the documents over here uh, to my right, Let's look at the prompt. Evaluate the extent to which the progressive movement fostered political change in the United States from 1890, or, yeah, 1890 to 1920. So a couple of things to note before we get started. Number one is the historical thinking skill that we're going to use. This is uh, pretty obviously going to be a, um, a uh, CCOT, continuity and change every time. This. It's talking about how it fostered political change in the United States. So, and evaluate the extent to which, that to me indicates, and you know how we talked yesterday, that there's gonna be some things you use that is an either or, and some of it um, will be just one or the other. Uh, this is going to be a situation where we're gonna do a uh, continuity and a change, but because it says evaluate the extent to which it fostered that political change, we're gonna have to use those qualifying words they're called, such as a major change or a minor change, but a major continuity. And so as we look through the documents, uh, and as you read through it, it'll become more evident as to what, what it should be, whether uh, there's a lot of change, whether things stay relatively the same, um, et cetera. So, uh, that's the first thing we wanted to point out, is that it's a, a continuity and change over time essay. So uh, that's the first thing that we, that we need to establish. Now, before you even start writing a thesis for a DBQ, we need to analyze the documents over here. Because you're, to write a DBQ, you're not using the information inside of your own head except for two times for outside evidence. Everything else has to come from these documents. Uh, that's why we write a thesis after we've looked at the documents over here. And um, with, and then again, I think that's all I needed to mention here before we start. Uh, uh, just 1890 to 1920, so we can't go outside 
of that time frame when we were writing our essay, but that is um, pretty self-explanatory. Again, for the video quiz, you're going to need to know these historical figures. Uh, hint, hint. Uh, the first historical figure is Alexander Hamilton. Uh, Alexander Hamilton. So uh, let's go ahead and start analyzing the documents. Um, I'll, I'm going to move the camera over so you can see it a little bit better as we start going over it. And I will stop sharing my screen um, so you can get kind of maybe a better view. But here's what we're working with. This is the chart that you're going to use to set up the essay. And uh, for the sake of allowing you to see this in a better view, you're probably not going to see my face during this part of it because uh, we're writing out on this on the uh, pieces of paper here. But uh, hopefully you still hear me and most importantly see this, which uh, will help you write the essay. So the first thing you need to do is set up this chart. This chart is actually going to be an assignment in Canvas a couple of days before the AP exam because this chart is a roadmap to writing your essay. You need this chart filled out as we are, or as you read the document so you can write the essay. If you do this well, writing the essay will be a piece of cake. It will be very, very simple. So um, I'm going to go ahead and renumber these documents. Before I recorded this video, I set it up as one, two, three, four, five, but um, we're gonna use the 2019 exam ignoring documents three and six. So we're gonna use four, five, and seven. So those are the documents we're going to use. One, two, four, five, and seven, ignoring three and ignoring six. Uh, because again, this is a modified version of the DBQ. So take a look at document one. I'm not going to read it because you should have already read that by this point. But it's a um, sort of uh, maybe a speech or uh, an interview or something with Jane Adams, who uh, founded the Hull House in Chicago for immigrants um, kind of in the late Gilded Age, beginning of the Progressive Era. So as you read over this, she's kind of talking about how in the Hull House there were um, unskilled voters, if you look here, swept on the street and dug the sewer. So if we're going to kind of summarize that document info, which is the first thing that we should do here, document info, what we could say, and again, we're thinking ahead to when we write our essay, um, we're looking for continuities and changes. And she is talking about how people were mistreated and how uh, they were still swept on the street, dug the sewer, et cetera, et cetera. They were unskilled voters. So they were mistreated, is what she's saying. So what we could say here is, um, you know, unskilled, and again, we're not quoting anything from her um, from her interview, but we could say unskilled uh, workers slash immigrants were often mistreated. Okay, so that's the information that we got out of reading Jane Adams. Now. Again, we could draw more conclusions from what she was saying in there, but in, in terms of writing the essay, as far as change within the United States and the progressive era, we need to hone in on continuities and changes. And, and, and if we're thinking ahead of the essay, the mistreatment of workers, that can be a continuity because workers were continually mistreated. Now, this section is required. You need to have all of this filled out and you need to have most of this filled out, your outside information, not always. It is something that, you know, would be nice to have, but you don't need it as often in this modified DBQ as we talked about yesterday. Still, you want to have at least one or two components of HIP filled out for every document. So, you know, if we're looking at the uh, point of view of Jane Adams, she's obviously pro-immigrant. Um, anytime when you're doing a point of view, you can use the word pro or anti, you're setting yourself up pretty good uh, using those words because that adequately expresses their point of view. Um, so if we're looking, uh, 
you know, we might control something else out. Uh, the intended audience, uh, we're not really sure who she is talking to, so we might leave that blank. If we wanted to use the H, we might could say yielded age. Um, but we're just brainstorming at this point. Um, so let's think of some outside information uh, for what Jane Adams is talking about with the whole house. So we could talk about the quote unquote new immigrants that came in. And if you remember, the uh, new immigrants were oftentimes uh, non Protestant Christians. So they were either Catholic or Jewish or Orthodox Christian, typically from Eastern Europe, which drove a lot of the uh, discrimination that they faced because they were uh, fundamentally different. Um, you know, we could might, we might could talk about corruption slash political machines. Um, but, you know, we just want something in each box. So I think that's a good starting point for us there. Um, if we look at document two now, document two is a uh, speech from Theodore Roosevelt in Providence, Rhode Island. So, and, and in here he's talking about how you know, corporations are not the greatest thing for the country, that they have a lot of power, that they are not really um, representative of the public, they're very powerful. Uh, there needs to be, basically the gist of what he's saying is that they are, you know, corrupted, or that they are corrupting government, and that they need to be reined in, they need to be regulated. If we kind of took the entirety of what he's saying here and summarized it and drew the most important things out of it. Uh, that's what we're trying to write down for document info. So for document two, which is the TR speech, we could say, you know, basically for the information we draw from it, uh, corporations were too powerful and needed to be drained in by the government, something like that. So that's the gist of what we're, what we're getting from TR. Um, this might be a good one we could use for um, intended audience. When he's given a speech, he's probably um, campaigning to some extent, even if it's not an election year, he's still trying to build a support. So for intended audience, we could uh, reasonably assume that he's speaking to, um, you know, uh, supporters at a campaign rally, supporters at a rally. That, that's a reasonable assumption that we can make. Um, if we want his point of view, he's obviously anti-trust. Uh, um, and again, we want something that's relevant to what he's saying. This is an important point to make. We could say that he's pro-environmentalism because he is. He did want to protect the environment, uh, at least to some extent. But what he's talking about in here is trust and corporations and things of that nature. So that's not directly relevant to the document. So we need to leave that out. Um, so we've got two things here. That's pretty good. Um, if we wanted to put an H, we could say beginning of the progressive era, um, not really necessary there because we already had two. But you know, if we, if we were in a bind and needed to grab one, we could. Outside information, which is another really important column in addition to the document info. Um, if you remember back to the Sherman Antitrust Act, that could be one because that was an early attempt to um, rein in corporations, rein in trust, was not as successful, uh, but he could be arguing, we don't have the rest of the speech, but he could feasibly argue that we need to expand on the Sherman Act, Sherman Antitrust Act. Um, he's talking about corporations, we could say something like, uh, you know, uh, if we wanted to think of working conditions within corporations, we could say something like the uh, book, The Jungle, which was written to expose the uh, conditions and, and, and uh, meat plants, meat packing plants, uh, that industry. Um, 
any, anything to that effect, I'm trying to think of something else that might could be used in addition to the uh, Sherman Act and the Jungle. We have two there. Um, you know, I'm tempted to say something like, you know, bad working conditions in factories, and that's true, but you want something specific that you can use. So the Sherman Act, the Jungle, those are specific, uh, you know, a book and a law. Those are specific things that we can point out, so that's better to use in just a vague term. Uh, the, the College Board prefers that you be to the point and precise in using some kind of vague uh, language that you don't really need. Um, okay, we're going to skip document three. Let's go to document four. And I believe that's the one where, uh, yeah, it's talking about the governor of California. So he is speaking to um, the uh, state assembly. So basically, on the st he's talking to the state legislature, essentially. And he's talking about how there needs to be um, direct legislation to recall officials. So if you remember uh, talking in class about the referendum initiatives, recalls, those three reforms uh, provided accountability to government because you could uh, put power directly in, uh, to the hands of the people. And then you could also recall them, which is what the governor is talking about in, in his speech, uh, recall officials who are not you know, serving the will of the people. So um, if we wanted to summarize what he's saying and pull information from it, uh, we could say something to the effect of, um, Officials in California should be removed from office if they are you know, corrupt slash ineffective. So, so this is something that would be a, a good kind of summary of what he's talking about. And this is something new. So thinking ahead to writing the essay over here in the outline, this could be a change that we reference um, in, in our essay. So we'll get to that later. But thinking ahead, anything you do now to, to help yourself when you're writing the essay, the better, um, which is important when we're filling this out here. So if we move over to HIP and think of some things, obviously his intended audience is very explicit here. Uh, members of California legislature, which could be important because they could pass the laws that he's wanting. Um, H, we could say, again, beginning of progressive era. Uh, the, the historical situation uh, here, the H and HIP is sometimes overused. Uh, spice your hip up, so to speak, by alternating what you use. Don't use the H all the time, although it is the most direct and straightforward one. You need to kind of alternate what we're uh, using here. Um, you know, if we're, if we're looking at his point of view, we could say that he is pro. Um, he's probably pro Republican, uh, at least pro Roosevelt Republican. Uh, TR, he's probably, uh, you know, uh, at least associated in some way with TR, so that could be a good point of view that he has. When we're going to outside information, uh, we could think of all of the things that uh, before this time period that it, this is in response to. So we could talk about corruption, we could talk about how uh, political machines, that would be a good um, piece of outside information to use. Uh, because this, the recall, and all of those reforms, referendum, initiative, et cetera, is in response to the corruption of political machines. So that'd be a good piece of outside uh, information we could use for this document. Uh, we could also talk about, um, I mean, we could probably put a referendum here because it's another type of, of reform. It's probably not the strongest piece of outside information political machines are. But this chart here is a brainstorm to help you write your essay. You're not graded on your chart, you're graded on what you write. Um, so anything you put down kind of brain dumping will be helpful. Um, so yeah, we have political machines, we have referendums. Um, let's see. 
There's nothing else that I can really think of for that. We don't want to waste time, uh, especially uh, on the actual DBQ. So we're going to move to document five, and I think that's the NAACP, yeah. So basically in this uh, document here, document five, the NAACP, which you uh, have talked about in class, uh, wrote a letter to uh, President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, after he was sworn into office. He was a, um, a progressive president, but he was uh, you know, fairly racist, both in his political life and in his, his personal life. So what we could talk about here uh, as we kind of read over the letter He's talking about the segregation of, of people of color in Washington. Uh, he's talking how they need to be segregated, how it's humiliating and stigmatizing to them that they are segregated. So a general gist of, of what the, the NAACP is saying is that, and remember, uh, this is important, the progressive era uh, tried to reform society. And when you're reforming society, you want to address the bad things and take them out if you can. And they looked at racism, saying, well, this is a bad thing in our society. We need to take it out and reform it. So why should we not include that in our progressive era reforms? That's essentially what he's saying in the letter. So we could say, uh, for our info, um, progressive reforms should be extended to um, African Americans and address racism. Okay, that's a good gist of what he's saying. He explicitly said segregation, but we don't really need to quote, absolutely not quote the documents if we can uh, help it. So, um, Moving over to HIP, it's pretty clear what the intended audience is. The NAACP wrote to President Wilson, so Woodrow uh, Wilson would be the intended audience. Um, looking at the, the, the age, which is sort of overused, but uh, we're getting kind of toward the end of the progressive era. Remember in 1920, uh, President Harding ran on the campaign of returning to normalcy. So we're about seven years or so away from that. So we're getting toward the end of the progressive era. They didn't know that at the time they wanted it to continue, but it didn't have that much long left, so we could say that. Um, point of view, it's obviously pro-racial integration. Um, so for our outside information, I can think of plenty uh, of pieces of outside information right off the bat. Uh, the, the one that, that most prominently comes to mind when we're speaking about the uh, conditions of African Americans is, is lynching in the South. Lynching is still going on uh, in addition to, so, so the NAACP, they're talking about segregation in some sort of, I think, uh, office building in Washington, D.C. when African Americans in the South are, are literally being lynched still. Um, so, so that's something that we need to uh, think about. Uh, we could also include stuff like poll taxes, uh, grandfather clause, clauses, um, you know, any anything that that proves or supports um, or adds context to the. Um, conditions of African Americans in this time period would be uh, a good one. We can't say segregation because that was mentioned in the document and you can't double dip. So, but all of these three, lynching, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, those are all uh, fine examples uh, that we can use to uh, support, uh, you know, saying something like the conditions of African Americans was, was a uh, continuity or something to that effect. Okay, that was document five. Let's uh, skip document six. Document seven deals with prohibition, and it's a political cartoon. So we need to uh, be careful here as to what, um, what we do with this because we're not actually reading a document, but with a political cartoon, you can still get a lot out of it, a lot out of it. So 
Uh, this is created by the uh, Anti Saloon League. Um, what they're saying is that it's sort of they're they're saying if you the gist of it is that the alcohol industry or the breweries they are basically uh, hurting families, and you see it has the the mother and her three children around her saying that these uh families are being hurt by the quote financial greed or the desire to earn a profit of the alcohol industry and so they're saying that the voter needs to vote for candidates that will push through legislation to either limit or alt all out ban the sale of alcohol so that's the, the kind of gist of it uh wet or dry uh a lot of you probably know what that means, but it's essentially saying wet. Uh, that means that you're drinking a, a lot of alcohol or dry, you're not drinking any. So that's the gist of, of the political cartoon. So again, if we want to take what the political cartoon says and kind of summarize it or get some information from it, we could say something to the effect of, of you know, political uh, office holders, should uh, support candidates who will limit sell of alcohol. Okay. So um, that's kind of the, the, uh, the main idea that we're getting from that political cartoon. I think of this sort of a summary or the main idea or whatever you need to. I apologize for the hip here. I ran out of room, so I had to move point of view over. Um, but as we're looking at the political cartoon, it's very clear that they are pro prohibition, pro prohibition. Fun play on words there. Uh, so they're uh, in favor of prohibition. Um, I mean, we could say they're anti-alcohol, but those are essentially two sides of the same coin. Um, the intended audience would be voters because that cartoon was attempting to persuade voters that they need to um, support candidates who will uh, be in favor of limiting the sale of alcohol, as we uh, wrote over here. Uh, so as we're looking, uh, we're obviously on the last document now, document seven. But we've got everything that we need uh, here. We have the document info, we have HIP uh, all filled out, and we have at least two pieces of HIP for each one. Now let's do, do some outside information for uh, the, um, oh, phone call, sorry. Uh, for the outside information, uh, we can think of probably um, industrialization would be one, I would say. Uh, we could say something like, uh, and, and because if you keep in mind industrialization with the uh, people who are uh, working longer hours and they're finding uh, relief in alcohol, uh, sort of escaping their stress and problems caused by industrialization, uh, that would be a good piece of outside information we could use. Uh, we're not quite to prohibition yet, but we're getting uh, to that way, but we don't really need to uh, include that if, or at this point. So if we kind of take a step back, let me take a step back and take a look at the chart that we have. Uh, everything we have is filled out. We have uh, information from each document. We have uh, at least two pieces of HIP for each document and an out some piece of outside information for each document. So this chart is good. Now what we're gonna do, this is really simple for writing the essay. We're gonna take this chart and put it in essay form. That's all we have to do. Uh, writing the DBQ, once you have this chart filled out, is very, very simple. So what we're gonna do now is I'm going to show you my uh, screen again, and we'll start writing the, the DBQ in just a minute, but I need to share my screen with you. Uh, hang tight just a second. Um, if, let me find it and get it pulled up. Um, I had a document for you that kind of details. Okay, here it is. Uh, share screen. Here it is. So 
what this is saying here is that there's a, a certain way you need to write your DBQ. And before we move over there and do the outline, we need to make sure that we understand the format first. Um, oh, uh, I apologize. I forgot to mention the historical figures. Um, the second and the third historical figures, the second one is George Patton, the third is Henry Clay. The second one is George Patton, the third is Henry Clay. Um, so as we're looking at the format of this here, this should look familiar, this section right here, the T format. That is how you've been writing your body paragraphs for your LEQs. You introduce it with the topic sentence, then you provide some evidence, and then this underlying information is how you uh, say, or excuse me, explain why the evidence you used supports your thesis or your topic sentence. Same exact idea here, except that instead of using information that you kind of pull out of your head, like you do for the LEQ, all you're doing now is taking the information that we wrote over there and putting it into, you know, essay form. It's really simple format um, to, to make. So what we're doing now is uh, just taking the, uh, the chart, putting it in essay form. So let's uh, go ahead and do that now with the outline we have uh, over here. The, oh, the first thing that I need to mention, though, is that whenever you are going through this, um, you're going to underline your analysis or explaining why just like you normally would, but you need to put your asterisk beside everything that you use, HIP, your document info, and your outside information. And um, whenever you're doing this, you need to uh, introduce your uh, document info with some component of HIP. So if I wanted to go back over here to this example, we could say, and I, I forgot to uh, mention this earlier, but we could say something to the effect of, and I don't know if you can see this very well, because uh, I'm still sharing the screen, but we could say that if we're looking at the top one, expressing a pro-immigrant point of view, Jane Adams argued that unskilled workers and immigrants were often mistreated typically because of political machines. So do you see how that kind of formatted that? So let's look at this again. We introduce it with a piece of hip. So we could say expressing a pro-immigrant point of view, Jane Adams argued that unskilled workers and immigrants were often mistreated, usually by political machines. See, all we're doing is taking this row and combining it into sentence format. That's what this kind of formula here is. That's all you've got to do. But at the end of that sentence, you would need to say uh, your citation. So you would say, uh, it could be something as simple as that, doc one. That's all you have to do. And um, make sure you cite it. You have to cite it. That's why it's uh, in caps, all caps down here. Uh, you have to make sure that you cite your document without quoting it. Do not quote the document. And that's why over here, when we filled out the chart, I said we're going to summarize or get the main idea out of uh, this document without actually quoting anything. You cannot quote anything or you will not get the point. Uh, okay, so what we're going to do now is uh, you should have your chart filled out by now. We're going to, since I already have this document pulled up, I'm not going to write it out. I'm going to type it so you might can see it a little bit better. But there's a certain format you need for an outline. And for the exam, you don't have to write an outline. If you're confident with what you have, you can go straight into the essay, but at least have a general idea of what you're going to be writing. So the first thing that we need is a thesis. So look at the five documents we've got. Remember, to get all three of those points that we talked about yesterday, you've got to use at least four documents. I recommend using all five of the documents because, like I said, if you misuse one of them, then you've got something to fall back on, okay? Whereas if you uh, misuse uh, one of them, but you only used four, then the most points you can get from that section is two points. So that's why I recommend doing all five so you can have something to fall back on. But look at the documents we've got. So if we have, and I'm going to kind of turn so I can see what I wrote. 
Uh, but you should have this filled out in your chart by now that you're going to submit. But, you know, looking at document one, the unschooled workers were mistreated. Well, think about it. Workers have kind of always been mistreated. So that would kind of fall under more of a continuity than a change. Looking at document number two, corporations were powerful, were too powerful, and needed to be reined in by the government. Well, in a sense, that's sort of a new idea that's been being uh, put forth by uh, leaders in government, because if you think back to the Gilded Age, they took a, a, a laissez-faire approach, hands-off approach, where they let businesses essentially do whatever they wanted. With this, they're saying, oh, we might need to reconsider that. What does reconsider a synonym for? A change. So we have one document in the continuity camp, another document in the change camp, okay? Let's look at document four. Uh, officials in California should be removed from office if they were corrupt or ineffective. That's a totally brand new idea because, uh, you know, really the only way uh, someone could be removed from office was if they were kind of in the federal level, like a uh, president, a judge, Supreme Court justice, etc. And that was through impeachment. And the people who vote on impeachment are in the Senate. A recall, the voters themselves vote uh, whether uh, someone should be removed from office or not. So that's a brand new idea. So that would definitely be in the change camp, in the change camp. But then if we look to um, document five, progressive reform should be extended to African-Americans and address racism. Well, let's think about it. We talk about lynching and poll taxes and grandfather clauses as our outside evidence, which comes a little bit before this, uh, or the letter from the NAACP was written. So because of that, we're, it's basically saying these conditions of African-Americans have not been addressed. And if you think forward far enough, it took until the 1960s with Martin Luther King Jr. and other leaders in the civil rights movement to get these issues addressed. So that's sort of a continuity of African-Americans still being mistreated. And so we could put document five probably in the uh, continuity camp. Uh, looking at document seven, which is our fifth overall document, political office holders should support candidates who limit the sale of alcohol. That's sort of a new idea because the people who are, um, you know, running for office beforehand, uh, you know, really didn't have much to say about alcohol. If you think back to the quote, log cabin and hard cider campaign of William Henry Harrison and John Tyler, uh, they, they would literally hand out alcohol, hard cider at their campaign rallies. So it's sort of a new idea that the candidate should be limiting the sale of alcohol. So that kind of falls into the change camp. So if we're looking, if we're keeping kind of a tally, uh, continuities could be documents one and five. Change could be documents two, four, and seven. And we understand why. One and five talking about how workers were still mistreated and five talking about how African Americans were still mistreated. That's obviously a continuity. Two, corporations need to be reined in, new idea. Officials can be removed if they're corrupt, new idea. Uh, so, uh, should limit the sale of alcohol if they're running for office. That's a new idea. So that, those are all changes that, that we can use in our essay. So if we're going to come up with the thesis statement for this, we could say, and again, it says, if we look back to the prompt, uh, well, my screen is stolen this, but you have the prompt in front of you. It was talking about how we should evaluate the extent to which, you know, progressive era, prompted political change or something to that effect. Basically, we're evaluating how, if you want to think about it this way, how progressive was the progressive era? And remember, being a progressive means you support change. So was there a lot of change or was there not a lot of change? And you could really argue this either way, to be honest, as long as you support it well. You could say that there is a major continuity or a minor continuity. You could say there's a major change or there's a minor change. Um, if we look at just our document groupings along, and if you remember the activity that I made on document, um, it was a document analysis activity that had the uh, Civil War documents and slavery and, and that. Uh, 
I talked about how we need to be grouping documents by theme, and that's what we just did. That's why it's very important that you're grouping your documents by theme. And if we do that, continuity and change group, we see two, four, and seven. Well, that's three out of our five documents that sort of express some kind of change. One and five, we only have two that express continuity. So, you know, I think we'd be safe to say that we're gonna, we're gonna have a major change because there's more documents supporting change, a minor continuity. But we need to first think of how, what was the major change? So we need to um, think about this in a way that our thesis statement is precise enough, but not too vague. We just can't say there was a major change because you know, people wanted change. That you're saying something, but, or excuse me, you're, you're talking a lot, but you're saying nothing. So we need to make sure that we're precise enough, but not vague enough. It's sort of a tight, kind of a tight rope to walk. But I think we could get away with saying that a major change was new ideas promoted that said government should be used to address problems in society. I think that's a, a good a thesis statement to make there. We're, we have number one, the qualifier word, evaluating the extent to which major. Um, that, that is something that, that is important for us to use. Um, Secondly, if we're going to look at the uh, continuity aspect, which we obviously need to, we could say a minor continuity was the continued mistreatment of certain groups in society. And then obviously that is precise enough. We're saying that there was mistreatment of certain groups in society, but we don't go into too much detail. Uh, yeah, because that detail is saved for our body paragraphs. So that's all we need for our thesis statement. We answered the prompt and we use those qualifying words, evaluating the extent to which. So we're promoting in our essay the idea that there is a major change in society. And we said what that was, government using or government being used uh, to address problems in society. That minor continuity, though, because we only have two documents promoting the continuity is uh, the fact that there was still mistreatment of certain groups. Again, saving the details of that for our body paragraph. So uh, the next part of our outline is contextualization. Let me try to spell it right. Yeah. So uh, remember, if you're thinking about contextualization, you need something that comes before, during, and after. The, the time period that we're talking about. And the time period in the essay uh, and the uh, fifth histor or excuse me, the fourth historical figure is Harriet Tubman. The fourth historical figure is Harriet Tubman. So the time uh, kind of period that this uh, essay looks at is 1890 to 1920. Some things that happened before, during, and after this era that kind of is related to, to the prompt of, of the progressive era. So we could say before. Now, here's the tricky thing. We cannot use anything from this chart that we just filled out in contextualization. Why? Because if we use this in our body paragraphs, which we will use a lot of it, if not all of it, or not all of it, excuse, let me rephrase that. You're gonna use all of the document info, a lot of this and at least one component of HIP for each document. Uh, but still, the point remains that we can't double dip anything we use here in contextualization because we we'll only get the point in one place. So we want to get as many points as we can. That's why it's tricky. But we could say before um, 1890, what was going on? Um, we're talking about the mistreatment of, of certain groups of people. Um, slaves, or excuse me, African-Americans, ex-slaves, and workers. Um, we could talk about the formation of unions. So I'm not gonna like physically write out this essay. Uh, I'm just gonna give you a basic outline of it. But before we could say uh, unions started to push for advanced 
left rights, but with limited success. I think that's a good thing uh, that we can say it directly relates to the prompt, but we never mentioned unions in our, uh, in our chart here. So that's good. Something that before, because if you think, you know, all the way back into the antebellum era, the, the kind of early to, to mid 1800s, uh, unions became more active, starting to push uh, for change. And the first part of our uh, time period starts in 1890. So we're safe using that. Uh, something that happened between 1890 and 1920, but something that we did not use in our, um, our chart. Uh, you know, let's think about it. We, uh, in the chart, we have corporations, officials, removed from office for corruption. Nope, that was before. I'm just trying to think out loud here. Oh, progressive era reforms for African Americans. Um, so alcohol, um, when was Triangle Shirtless Factory Fire? 1917, I think. Yeah, 1917. So during, we could say, um, workers, Let's make sure we phrase this right. The Triangle Shirt Waste Factory Fire occurred in New York City, exposing the extremely dangerous working conditions of the era. And I think that will get us the point because um like jane adams and one she's talking about unschooled workers but they were also immigrants so we can make sure that we frame that from an immigrant point of view when we're using that um and, and then again we didn't use triangle shirtwaist factory fire anywhere at all during this um chart so we're good with that uh some that happened after 1920 well if we're talking about change in society, I mean, 1920 is sort of a turning point year uh, because we had this quote unquote return to normalcy by Warren G. Harding. Uh, and that return to normalcy kind of undid, uh, at least to some extent, the uh, progressive era reforms that were achieved. So I think that would be a good one that we could use. And again, we didn't mention that anywhere in our charts, so it would be safe to, to use that. Uh, we could say during the 1920s conservative presidents undid many progressive era progressive era reforms by promoting a return to normalcy yeah okay that's good so uh, again, with our contextualization, we're putting things kind of in the context of, of the times we have something before, during, and after. Um, and they all relate to kind of, you know, progressive era problems in society, conditions of workers, unions, and then undoing that for, for after. So I think that's a good uh, contextualization paragraph we have. Um, okay, so the next thing we need is our body paragraph number one. And we need obviously to start off with the topic sentence. So here's the thing. Your topic sentence needs to come directly from your thesis. So a major change, and again, here's something that I also need to point out. Your first body paragraph needs to be whichever one you deemed most important. So we said that the change was the most important. It was a major change. So that needs to come in our body paragraph, number one, because it shows you know we're getting to it right off the bat we are showing that we you know, sincerely believe it was a major change. So um, again, we're just gonna say a major change from 1890 to 1920 was the idea of using government I think we'd be safe with using all levels of government, including 
federal to address um, can societal conditions especially of the poor I think address is too weak of a word. We need to say reform. Yeah, that's a better word. Because you can address something by just like saying, oh, that exists and doing nothing about it. They actually addressed it and then changed it. Uh, so that's something we could use there. And I think that's a pretty good topic sentence. So what are the documents we're using for our changes? Well, we said documents two, four, and seven. So um, I'm going to do one of those documents as an example, and then you can do the rest of them um, on your own. But I need to show you, and for the sake of making sure this video is not excessively long, I'm going to do document two, which is just the first one that we'll come to, although you can put them in whatever order you want to, as long as you use all of your change documents in the change paragraph. So again, we're going to, and this chart, uh, I'm not going to like pick up the camera and show it to you again. You should have written this down by now. Um, and also the fifth historical figure is Martha Washington. The fifth historical figure is Martha Washington. So taking your chart, look at document two, which is the first document we're going to use for the change paragraph. We could say something like addressing supporters at a campaign event in Rhode Island, Theodore Roosevelt promoted the well, or no, we'll say idea, the idea that corporations were too powerful and we need to star what we're, what we're doing. So we introduced it with hip. So there's our hip component. We're too powerful and needed to be reined in by the, yeah, he would say federal government. So I misspelled, maybe, I don't know, we'll go with it. And remember the college board thankfully doesn't count off for spelling. So they need to be, um, they were too powerful and needed to be reined in by the federal government. There's our document info, comma, and now we need to conclude if we're following that kind of formula up here, hip document info outside information is next. So what do we put for outside information? The Sherman Act or the jungle? Um, I think that in this situation, the Sherman Act would be the stronger piece of outside evidence to use. So we could say um, something like, which would have been a stronger version of the Sherman Antitrust Act star, because that's our um, outside information. So that is the format that you're going to use for your evidence. That whole sentence is your evidence, which you introduced with tip. And then you did some outside, or excuse me, the information from the document. And then you concluded it with some outside information. So now we're explaining, and now we need to do the underlying part. Why is this important? Which is how you get that analysis point, which is uh, going to be important for um, getting as many points as you can on this exam and doing yourself a favor with your score. So we could say, and here's the way I do it. This is very dry. It doesn't sound good, it doesn't flow. But guess what? These kinds of essays don't need to flow. They don't need to sound good. This is not an English essay and we're just trying to get as many points as we can. So we can literally say, this is important because, and then we just write why we think the evidence we just listed is important. And I know, like I said, this does not sound good. But it's a very direct way, it's a very straightforward way to do all you can to tell the reader, hey, look, here's my analysis. Hey, look, here's my evidence. You're doing all you can to make it easy on your reader 
And if you make it easier on your reader, you're only helping yourself get as many points as you can. So uh, taking a look at what we just used for our evidence with the uh, document two, oh, which we needed to cite, that's something very important. Uh, I'm very sorry I forgot it, but all we have to do is say document two at the very end of cite that document. Um, because that, all, that will also help your reader uh, know that, that you're using that document. And I think there might be a point related to just citing your document. So make sure you cite your document. Uh, and I've got a lot, of, a lot of things going on here at once, which is why I forgot, but make sure you're, you're citing that document. So uh, why is this important? This is important because prior to this, time period, many people argued that the government should be used solely for the purpose of protecting the profits of corporations which was vaguely and in a weak way addressed in the Sherman Anti-Trust Act and then we can say parentheses although Roosevelt wanted to go even further. Okay. Something like that. That could be our our explanation why that that that's important. Um, because we're showing how it's changed. Because prior to this time period, and we can even name drop the Gilded Age. Yeah, that that make that even stronger. How people argued that the government should be used like that hands-off approach that we talked about should be used uh, to kind of protect the, 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 prof, the profits uh, of those corporations, hands-off, no regulations, no safety regulations, et cetera. And then we're addressing our piece of outside evidence by saying that it was addressed in the Sherman Antitrust Act, it was vague, it was weak, and TR wanted to go even far, farther with that, okay? So that's how we do a change. Um, the sixth historical figure is Daniel Webster, by the way. The sixth historical figure is Daniel Webster. We take this format, the same exact format, and we do it for document four and document seven in, in this essay. And I won't do that because we're running kind of low on time, but we follow that same format. We introduce it with HIP. We give our document information, conclude, with our outside evidence, that same formula. Think of it, if you're a math person, that's a formula for you. Just memorize that formula and plug in the stuff from the chart back here, your uh, HIP document info outside information. And then you underline it and explain why that's important. Like we did here saying that it changed because the government uh, is kind of taken on a new role because prior to that, it was only protecting corporations. All right, let's do our body. Let's get rid of underline body uh, paragraph number two, which is gonna be our, our continuity paragraph. So if we're looking at this, um, we, we scroll back up through our thesis statement. We said that a minor continuity was a continued mistreatment of certain groups in society. Um, so, and, and the two documents we're gonna use, the unskilled workers and the progressive era reforms one and five, documents one and five. Uh, so we need to write a topic sentence. Remember this formula up here, topic sentence comes first in your paragraph. So we could say um, a minor continuity was the continued mistreatment and discrimination of the poor and minority groups in society. And, and using the poor, that will take care of document one, which is a, a 
whole house document of Jane Adams, the immigrants, and then minority groups will take care of the um, African American, the NAACP document and the mistreatment of people of color. So with that in mind, we can now launch into doing a, a document uh, like we did up here. And with this one, we, we'd use both. I'm just gonna pick the NAACP, the document five, the letter they wrote, wrote to Wilson, because I think I can make a better example of that. So um, we're gonna, again, introduce it with it. So what do we say? And the progressive era, Woodrow Wilson for our intended audience and pro-racial integration. What did I use up here? In this? So I used his intended audience here. I'm gonna use something different just to give you an example. So either the H or the P, huh, which is also the name of the printer. Um, okay, we're gonna do the, the P, the point of view. So expressing a pro-racial integration, and I would even go as far to say equality, point of view, star, cause that's our uh, hip component, the uh, point of view. Uh, the NAACP, we don't need to spell that out uh, because it's a common acronym. The NAACP, contended that progressive era reforms should be extended to address the unfair plight of African Americans. And then star making sure I worded that right. Yeah, that's a good way to word it. So, and then for our outside information, we had the lynching poll taxes and grandfather clauses, which was seen in the widespread lynching of African Americans in the South. Star, but first use star because that is our outside information. Cite the document, document five, done. So there is that formula that we talked about HIP document info outside information. Okay, so that, that's what we need. And then we cited the document. Now we explain why this is important. Why is this a continuity? So we can say, again, our choppy writing, but it's still going to get us a point. This is important because, this is important because, and we could say, um, this is important because even though African Americans were freed from slavery by the 13th Amendment, they were, Sometimes you write in all caps, you can draw emphasis and still, like they still, that, that sort of emphasizes a continuity. They were still denied basic rights, such as, I mean, you could say the right to life that white Americans still had. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to put that. And it's not quite as long. Um, and then I think, and that's still, and I think we explained the significance of the lynching that we used for our outside evidence by saying that they were denied the right to life. You think back to the uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, Jefferson argued you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, if you're being lynched, you're obviously being denied your right to life. So that, that explains that. I'm just looking to make sure. Yeah. And I think that'll get us a point. Just trying to double check here. Yeah. 
I think that's good. And then you'd obviously just replicate that for the um, document one, the whole house document with Jane Adams. And you'd basically just take out where it says like racial integration and African Americans and put in like uh, unfair living conditions and workers, uh, kind of using that same format if you'd like. Okay, what comes next? That would be our complex understanding point. And again, uh, I want to make sure I'm clear on this. You are to use all five of those documents. I'm just using a, a couple documents. I use two examples, one for change, one for continuity to kind of get you the idea of it. And then when we look at your the essay, uh, the DBQ that you're going to write, uh, we will uh, make sure you have that down pat and, and maybe make another screencast or something if you don't. But we're going to get you prepared uh, for this. So what could we say is a... Um, and again, you can do a counter argument or you can do a historical parallel for here, this complex understanding. And I'm pretty sure I mentioned this yesterday in yesterday's video, but it is a lot easier and a lot more straightforward to get the point for a historical parallel uh, than it is for the, the counter argument. Although the counter argument can be uh, easy too, if it's a clear enough counter argument, but the historical parallel all you're doing is looking throughout history, or at least American history, and saying, well, here's a time where this was similar. And, um, you know, and, and, and that's easy, at least to me, because you've probably heard the saying, well, history repeats itself. Well, it doesn't really repeat itself. A more accurate saying would be that history rhymes. History doesn't really repeat itself. It's, you have kind of different players, but you have the same game, if you want to think of it that way. And so if we're looking at this, we're seeing continued uh, mistreatment and, and discrimination. We could, um, and then up here, our change is using the government to address reforms. Um, okay, I think the most straightforward thing that we can come up with for our complex understanding point would be um, the New Deal. Okay, this is obviously outside the time period, New Deal is like 1933 to the 40s, uh, which is outside of the time period out of 19, past 1920 is what I'm trying to say. And if you think of it, the New Deal, FDR used the power of the federal government to bring about reforms in society. He said, well, people don't have a job. Well, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to use the federal government to, you know, provide electricity to the uh Appalachia region of the country, Appalachia, I think is how you say it. Uh, but anyway, you're using the federal government's money and power to give people a job. That's why you're sort of using the government to address that reform that needed to be changed. So we could say a historical parallel and hold that thought for just a second, because the seventh historical figure is William Jennings Bryan. Williams Jennings Bryan is the seventh historical figure. The historical parallel to using government to reform society is the New Deal promoted by Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s and 1940s, okay? And star would be New Deal, okay? And now, kind of using the same idea of underlining, and I'm going to do that in this complex understanding uh, point, this is a, a historical, historical parallel because President Roosevelt used the money and power of the federal government to, I mean, he did a lot of things, to establish a minimum wage um, in child labor. Um, there was a child, yeah, there, he, he did pass a child labor bill um, and establish maximum working hours 
And again, everything I just listed, minimum wage, max working hours, end of child labor, that's using the federal government to address some problem in society. So that would be a historical parallel. Um, we could even go further. We could say he also used the federal government's resources to give people a job like in the works progress administration and the Tennessee Valley Board. when they were unemployed as a result of the Great Depression. Okay. So for this complex understanding point, we said that it's similar to the New Deal uh, because he used the government to reform society and then we explained how uh, he used it to uh, address these reforms or excuse me, address these problems through reforms such as minimum wage, maximum working hours, et cetera, and giving the people uh, a job. And we even listed two agencies he used to do just that. So that, that would be how he, um, that's similar to the progressive era. Okay, so the last point that we should be doing here is restate thesis. And we're just doing that to kind of do ourselves a favor, like I've kind of been emphasizing throughout the video. Um, if you do yourself a favor, you want to. It'll help you get more points. Um, so we could say something like a major change in society was using the full power and weight of the federal government. Let me see what I wrote for the original thesis. Okay to reform major problems in society that were unfair to the poor and middle class. Okay. And then say a minor continuity during this time period was the continued discrimination and unfair treatment of certain groups, certain minority groups. Was Just restating that thesis there. Um, so this is kind of an outline of, of how you would do a DBQ. When you write your DBQ, obviously use all of the documents, only use two to get you the gist of it. And again, if you need more, I'll make a, another video for that. But uh, kind of that same outline explaining how you're writing this and then uh, using that chart, you know, as, as the, the roadmap, so to speak, of making your DBQ. So the final, the eighth and final historical figure is going to be Mary Todd Lincoln. Mary Todd Lincoln. Um, so I hope this uh, video helps you. Go ahead, submit the chart that you filled out and this outline that we've kind of been working on together um, under this assignment in Canvas and then go take the video quiz using these historical figures that we've been mentioning throughout the video. Um, I think that that's all I have. I'm going, uh, you're going to be assigned a, a modified DBQ. It'll be due on Monday night at 11.59. So I'm giving you a shortened amount of time on that, but that's because you need to be used to writing within sort of a time crunch. Because remember on the AP exam, you'll have about 45 minutes to, uh, to do this. So uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I gave you uh, my email yesterday, but here it is again. Um, if you have any questions, let me know and we will uh, happily uh, talk about them. Uh, maybe make another video if you need it. But there's the outline for the DBQ. Um, I hope you're well. I hope you're healthy. And uh, if there's anything that, that I can do uh, for you, please let me know. But um, I think that's it. Go ahead and take your quiz and, and, and good luck on your uh, DBQ that's coming up.